It's a great honour and privilege to be asked to come here this morning um, as AG and participate in what I think is um, a very important movement for adult liter literacy and a very important conference. And it's clear from listening to Inez and Eamon um, that this is going to be a very um, valuable event today. And I'm only sorry that the government has a few legal problems and I'll have to go back mid-morning and sort some of them out. Um, and the only thing I give out to Eamon about is for setting a very high standard early in the morning. It's a hard act to follow. and. Uh, um, I'm glad you reminded me about I was going to say at the more broad level, I think that the movement for adult literacy fits in with what should be one, I think is one of the fundamental aims of government to achieve, you know, any government that's there to achieve a greater level of social justice. Because I think um, for people to have greater levels of adult literacy enables them to participate better in the society they live in and achieve a higher quality of life and also deal with the hard questions from their children, which was something that Eamon reminded me about, which we all have to deal with because we all have the problem that our kids know a lot more than we ever knew and they can tap into information at the drop of a hat and they, they're demanding and they don't like it when we haven't got at least able to answer and uh, I suffer as much as anybody from not understanding at times what my children are, are saying to me. Um, but uh, thanks very much, Eamon, for that talk. It was uh, really good to start the day off. Um, I suppose before I get going and say some things about plain English or plain language, and I'll come to whether there's a difference between the two, um, Nala hasn't beaten their own drum much this morning, maybe because they say self-praise is no praise, but I did just get some help from from Sean, who's with me here this morning, um, my special advisor, to look up um, some of the recent achievements of Nala. And uh, I understand that NALA has um, helped almost 57,000 people access adult literary services nationwide um, over the last number of years. And it's produced 13 highly acclaimed TV series about adult literacy and provided information and advice on adult literary services to 120,000 people who've called the NALA support line um, free phone since 2000. I will make available a copy of this paper if anybody wants to um, note anything that I say to save people the, the trouble of trying to keep up with me if I'm talking too fast, which is uh, another problem. Um, if I come on then um, to just broadly, first of all, set the context for the plain la English or plain language movement. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have had some experience with the law in some shape or form, whatever it is, even just reading legal notices or some information about something in your lives. Um, sometimes the law has to provide for things in a very detailed um, and precise way, but that should not be at the expense of clarity. And I suppose one must recognise that there are varying levels of literacy across society. And not using plain English risks, you know, alienating some people from accessing the law and um, harming their ability to, to access the law. And um, i just going on a slight tangent for a moment before we come back to the specifics of plain English, uh, plain English or plain language. Beforehand I was speaking with Inez about how in some ways the plain language movement fits into the broader context of um, access to the law, which usually takes place more in the context of funding free legal aid um, and the free legal, uh, the, you know, the legal aid, the state legal aid service will never have enough money to directly provide funding to have enough solicitors and legal aid centres around the country. But the other side of that coin is um, for people to access the law if they can understand the law themselves and in communities particularly lower income communities, if they can more directly themselves have some access to their legal rights and can combine together to pursue their legal rights, particularly in areas like housing and uh, social welfare in, in deprived communities. And some of this is challenging for government to help promote that and to fund it because they will be suing the government when they do get that <laughs> um, assistance. But, but I do think it's part of the debate that should take place over the next couple of years as our economy comes out of the crash and expectations rise and there is not enough money to directly fund um, things like 
as many legal aid centres and as many solicitors in them to directly provide legal advice to people. The other way to do that, and the indirect way to do it, is the kind of work that NAL are doing in, in making people aware that if they can get an initial understanding of that they may have a legal right to something, they can combine together as a community and help to achieve uh, um, proper access to their rights. Now, having just put those things um, by way of a general introduction, can I come on to, first of all, um, you know, slightly more legalistic perhaps, hopefully in reasonably plain language, um, what is the difference between plain language or plain English? Sometimes people use one phrase or, or the other, uh, and there is a difference between the two. Plain language is probably the broader term and is more suitable in countries where there's more than one language or, or, or where the country is bilingual. In Ireland, of course, the Constitution says that Gaelic is the national language and at least of equal value to English, um, and legislation is supposed to be written in both languages. So plain language is probably the better term to use, even though I myself fell into the trap of saying plain English in the law. And of course, as well as that, um, plain language is also a broader term in that it encompasses things like design and layout um, and so on, and it includes mathematical language and flowcharts and characters as well as words. So it's probably the more correct term to use plain language rather than plain English, because English is just a particular type of language, but the two are often used interchangeably and, ro and rolled together. Um, whichever one is used, wh what does it mean? Um, the plain language movement evolved as a reaction to the, the complexity of legal language. Um, it's a, plain language is a concept which is extremely difficult to define because it means different things to different people. And it's also a relative concept. Um, plain language invites the question, plain to whom? Depends who the listener, the person hearing the language is. Um, so there's a number of different attempts at definitions, um, some of which have been set out in a Law Reform Commission consultation paper back in 1999, and I'll give the reference to that for anybody that wants it in the paper that I'll send on to Inez tomorrow. But a couple of the efforts in that consultation paper was a man called Eagleson described plain language as follows. Plain language is clear, straightforward expression, using only as many words as are necessary. It's language that avoids obscurity, inflated vocabulary, and convoluted sentence structure. It is not baby talk, nor is it a simplified version of the English language. Or another person in chapter three of that paper said, plain language means writing that is straightforward, that reads as if it were spoken. It means writing that is unadorned with archaic, multisyllabic words and majestic turns of phrase that even educated readers cannot understand. Plain language is clear, direct, and simple, but good plain English has both clarity and grace. And um, even in the legal profession, working with other legal professionals and barristers, I've had times where um, I've had to have the dictionary beside me reading a draft document that a junior counsel has sent me to settle. And even in the last year or two, in one leading case I was in, um, there were two or three words in the draft document that I'd never heard before and I didn't understand. Luckily one has the phone beside you now and you can always bang it straight into the phone to find out. But I struck out all of those words in the final version of the document because if I didn't understand them, and I mightn't be the greatest at English, but there was a chance the judge mightn't understand them or the opposition wouldn't understand them, so there was no point including the word. Um, and, and perhaps some people do it to show off, to be frank about it. I mean, there's an element of that maybe, to come up with a word that nobody else has heard before. Um, can, I, can I just maybe run around a few topics um, as quickly as, as we can? I'll try and keep an eye on the, on the clock. Um, the, the idea of the, you know, the need for plain language um, fits in with partly into the difficulty of the potential obscurity of the whole legal process and the court system. and. Um, you know, sometimes said that, um, you know, courts proceedings must be formal. It's a very serious business to the courts and so on. Uh, and that's, you know, true to an extent. And it's true that to an extent, a judge has to be above the fray and the judge can't go overboard to help one party in the court um, more than the other party and so on. But that doesn't mean that people shouldn't understand court proceedings. And indeed, the opposite is true. If people are to have 
people are supposed to have a constitutional right of access to the courts, and if they're to be properly able to avail of that right, they have to be able to understand the proceedings they're taking part in. And a lot of people find um, there's a lot of almost, you know, um, what's the right word, ceremonial aura about the whole business down if they arrive down in the four courts for a particular case or in a local courtroom around the country. Um, and, you know, if people can be given a greater awareness and knowledge of the legal system and its rules and requirements, that would go a good way to helping to demystify the process. But another thing that's very important is if the lawyers involved, if people have a lawyer, whether it's a solicitor or a barrister, that they speak to their own clients in plain language that their own clients can understand. Um, we tend to, at times in the legal world, live in a bit of a bubble and in a world of our own and talk to ourselves an awful lot and forget about how to talk to, to our own clients. And the value of communicating with ordinary people uh, who come in off the street without jargon, without unnecessary legal terminology, and without over-reliance on Latin phrases that Connor mentioned. It's not just the Irish Times. Lawyers used to love legal phrases as well. Uh, and the value of doing that should be emphasised. And um, I'm a Jesuit boy myself, and I went to the Jesuits. I was lucky enough to, to go to school in Belvedere College. And I did Latin for six years. But I try and leave it behind me now and not carry it on. But the law at times loves legal phrases. And they say things like, res ipsa loquitur is a rule of evidence. It really means that the evidence speaks for itself. It came from a famous case where a, a man walked into a building and a bag of flour fell down from on high and hit him on the shoulder. And it was said that, was the owner of the building negligent? And it was said, res ipsa loquitur, the evidence speaks for itself, bags of flour, do not get up high on their own and fall down without being left in a position where they can fall down. And that was the end of the case. In other words, that the person really had very little evidence they had to offer. The fact spoke for itself. But that phrase carried on from a case in something like 18, 1867 for over a hundred and whatever number of years until people started to put it into an English phrase um, that people could understand more easily. And that, that's just one example. Um, in the paper, I'll give you an example from more modern times of the type of problems with um, the lack of plain English. There's a case called AIB versus McKenna as recently as 2014. Um, Connor mentioned this type of thing about the terms and conditions in things like travel documents or travel contracts, as they probably um, are, um, where the court was in the AIB case. It was looking at a guarantee and, you know, as well as you know, high big business transactions. Sometimes ordinary people have to sign guarantees for their child to get a loan for college fees, we'll say. And guarantees tend to be full of total jargon, where even though it's a very important thing that somebody is signing that, you know, if their child doesn't end up being able to repay the loan, that they have to, they have to pay it. And sometimes this could be a very adult child who's starting their own business. And it could be a risky thing where the parent might have enough money, but only if they were to sell their house or something. So it's a very serious thing for people to sign a guarantee. But this, phrase, this clause, anyway, in this case, um, um, was described by Mr. Justice Birmingham, now the Court of Appeal um, President, as he said, the clause would not receive an award from the campaign for plain English. And <laughs> I'll, I'll read out some of it for you. It goes on a bit, but it starts off, where this guarantee is executed by more than one individual, the agreements and obligations on the guarantor's part herein contained shall take effect as joint and several agreements and obligations, and none of the guarantors shall be released from liability hereunder by reason of this guarantee ceasing, ceasing brackets by any means whatsoever, close brackets, to be binding as a continuing security in any other guarantor, brackets, S, close brackets, etc., etc. Um, um, so, there's a real imperative for, it's really solicitors I can pass this book to, to when drafting, you know, documents like contracts or legal letters to try and achieve clarity. And I am aware that NALA had a joint initiative with Mason, Hayes and Curran um, to produce a document called Plain English and the Law, the Legal Consequences of Clear and Unclear Communication in 2017, because after I spoke at another conference in, um, in April, where I touched on this topic, um, a solicitor from Mason, Hayes and Kern 
gave a copy to my wife at, my, at our daughter's J match the following Saturday and said, give this to the attorney, he should read this. And, um, and I read about it. And there are a number of practical examples in that, one of which was a case that I was involved in myself, the Corbally case, where I was the legal assessor and a dispute arose all about the advice that I'd given to the Fitness to Practice Committee and whether they'd followed the advice and so on. And happily, that was dissected by the Supreme Court, but I came out reasonably okay out of it, <laughs> happily in the end. Um, just to sort of say what's happened in other jurisdictions before I mention what has happened here to date, um, this, I, this movement for more plain language started, I suppose, in the 1970s, perhaps, in places like America, um, or other jurisdictions first. As far back as 1978, a, a professor of law in the University of California quoted, wrote an article in one of the law reviews, and he quoted um, the famous economist John Kenneth Galbraith, who said, there are no, no important propositions that cannot be stated in plain language. The truth is not difficult. Complexity and obscurity have professional value. They are the academic equivalents of apprenticeship rules in the building trades. They exclude the outsiders, keep down the competition, preserve the image of a privileged or priestly class. So that was a rather negative view of things in terms of the professions using obscure language deliberately to, to keep down the competition and exclude the outsiders. Uh, I hope things are not quite as bad 30 years later or are moving in the right direction. Um, in 1987, the Law Reform Commission of uh, the state of Victoria in Australia um, produced a report entitled Plain English and the Law. And it said that the problems with the law being, and the language of the law being too complex and needlessly complicated, went back to Jonathan Swift, Jonathan Swift in Gulliver's Travels that there have been remarks made about it in all of these famous old novels, Charles Dickens in Bleak House, James Joyce in Ulysses, and even Groucho Marx in Animal Crackers all made this criticism. And it set out, again, some you know, extraordinary examples of overly convoluted language, um, one of which was in the 1984 uh, legislation in, in Australia called the Foreign Proceedings Excess of Jurisdiction Act 1984, and it was all about recovering costs in certain legal proceedings. And subsection three, again, a bit like the guarantee clause I read out earlier, went on for 14 lines in terms of, and I read the first few lines of it, proceedings in respect of a cause of action arising under this section, brackets, in this subsection referred to as, quote, cost proceedings, end quote, close brackets, in relation to proceedings instituted in or before a foreign court, brackets, in this subsection referred to as the, quote, foreign proceedings, end quote, close brackets, may be instituted, comma, notwithstanding that the foreign proceedings are still pending, comma, in respect of recoverable costs and expenses that have been incurred by a defendant in the foreign proceedings, etc., etc., for 14 lines. This section, the report noted, simply meant two and a half lines. Proceedings may be commenced at any time for recoverable costs and expenses incurred in the foreign proceedings and at later times for recoverable costs and expenses subsequently incurred. So that was a good example that they set out. In this country, the first go at doing something really um, to improve the situation was in 1999, We do have a Law Reform Commission, funded by the taxpayer, um, um, set up in legislation in 1975 to bring about reform of various areas of the law. And in fairness to them, one of the things they looked at back in 1999-2000 was this area of, particularly in the context of legislation and statutes. And they produced a very interesting consultation paper in July 1999, called Statutory Drafting and Interpretation, Plain Language and the Law, and then they followed up a report the following year. And while it's now almost two decades old and dealt mainly with the area of drafting of legislation, there are a number of very useful points made, um, made in the, both the consultation paper and the report. The report recommended shorter sentences and more familiar language be used in legislation. Um, uh, and, and phrasing and structure that related more closely to common everyday usage. Um, and these are important principles that um, they set out. We did have then a measure called the Interpretation Act 2005. So 
a piece of legislation about interpreting legislation, and that made a start in terms of trying to um, talk about how legislation would be understood and interpreted. But I think it's probably um, worthwhile considering whether or not um, it's time for a further a round two of that exercise um, of looking at you know, a lot of law, some of the laws in judgments of the court, and that really depends on the individual judges, the type of language they use, but the government itself is responsible for legislation. So one of the two things the Attorney General's office is responsible for, one is advising the government on, any, on all legal disputes affecting government departments and government bodies and the government as a whole, and the other is the Attorney General's office, there's about 40 people in my office that work on drafting new laws. So the whole time um, there's always demand for new legislation. Um, across the board. You'll see in the newspapers from time to time there's been a row about something and the government is going to look at bringing in new legislation. That's drafted in my office and um, um, so you know we have a big responsibility in terms of the way the legislation is drafted and trying to promote the use of more clear and, and simple language. The other thing I'll just mention on the topic of access to the law is another important piece of work that the Law Reform Commission do. They try to make the law more accessible by bringing together and doing what are called administrative consolidations of laws. So I'm departing from simple language now. Consolidation means, you know, in areas like if people want to know what are their rights and what are their obligations about drinking and driving, for instance, the law is set out in a patchwork of legislation you know, you may have a Road Traffic Act 1961 amended by a Road Traffic Act 1976, amended by another one in 1980-something and 90-something, and you've got about five or more pieces of legislation which interconnect uh, rather than one piece of legislation that brings it all together into one document. It costs money to do that. Public money, you've got to make resources available. They did it, say, with the income tax legislation eventually back around 2000 but now it's 18 years later, to put it all into one document. They did it with the Companies Act, I think, in 2014. But another area would be an area like the Road Traffic Act, which is basic kind of, in a way, rules and obligations applying to people who drive vehicles on the road. And even lawyers have difficulties at times finding what's the relevant piece that was last amended or updated. But the Law Reform Commission do it's not the same thing as putting it all officially into one act and calling it the Road Traffic Act 2018. They do what's called an administrative consolidation, where they consolidate it in a sort of an unofficial way. They piece it together into one document. Um, but all of that stuff now is available. Again, the joys of modern technology and the internet. Anyone can look up um, on the internet the revised whatever it is, and you find the, say, the Ro Road Traffic Act, you'll find I think over the Law Reform Commission, there are over 300 revised act, acts which have been compiled together by the Law Reform Commission, and that's a very valuable um, service and contribution to accessibility to the law. Um, so I've gone on for quite a while, I'm sure probably over my time. Um, there's a lot of things one could discuss in this area, but I think, again, the, um, the fundamental point is the work that was started by the Law Reform Commission back in 1999-2000, it's perhaps time to um, review that now 18 years on, following the Interpretation Act 2005, and consider whether or not um, more could be done in the area of promoting plain language in the law. Thank you very much.